Welcome back to Reading Roof. In this video, we'll discuss the implications of the first word of the Book of Ruth. To begin, let's take a look at how this word is translated in the various translations. KJV translates it as, Now it came to pass. The NASB, Now it came about. The NIV offers no translation of this word. At first, you might hear that it, the NIV basically omits this word in translation and think, why would they do that? So let's look for an answer quick. First of all, the word vayehi most literally is translated, there was or it was, or he was. Uh, we can see that literal translation later on in this verse in every single translation. So the same word appears here, vayahi. Notice it looks exactly like this. Even though you don't know how to spell it, you can at least see that if you think of it like a picture, it looks like the same exact picture as this. So later on in the verse, it's translated right here, literally, there was, also here, there was, and also here, there was. So in the NIV, NASB, and KJV, they, get, uh, they offer a literal translation of this word later in the verse, but for some reason, none of them offer a little transla literal translation at the beginning, and the NIV decides simply to omit the word entirely. So, in all honesty, I have no clue why, when you could simply say it was in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, you choose to turn it instead into five English words, now it came to pass. The only thing I can think of is perhaps times were different back then, and that was the most appropriate way to translate the word, a word that is literally translated there was it was or he was um, so yeah i have no idea now the nasb i really struggle to understand who decided to translate this this way the only thing i can think of here is that uh if by chance it was appropriate for the kjv in their day and age, which by the way was translated back in for the first time in 1608. Uh, it's, this is already definitely far a long shot from a literal translation. And now the NASB has, I don't know, copied them? And uh, just changed to pass into about. Now it came about. And still a big four words for one Hebrew word. Um, Honestly, I feel like if you're going to alter the text, the NIV has the right idea. Just get rid of it entirely. Uh, but to each his own. Different people like different translations. And uh, yeah, so one thing I will say is that the word vayihi is the narrative past tense. Is It appears in the narrative past tense. So vayihi, the narrative past tense is the most common verb form in Hebrew. Uh, real quick. In case you're a little hazy on what a verb is, a verb, I would say very simply, is any any word that conveys a sense of action or a state of being, uh, and that also carries with it a sense of time. I think that those are your, your check boxes. Does it tell me an action or a state of being? And and does it convey a sense of time? So, in the case of Vayihi, it's it conveys it. It's literally translated. There was, it was, he was, and uh, and so even also in English, that puts this in the past. We have a sense of this being something in the past. Now, unlike English, we don't really have a narrative past tense form of our verbs. Uh, so that's a unique thing about Hebrew, and it's also an interesting thing about the way this book begins. 
because this is the most common verb form in the Bible, even Israelis would probably overlook the oddity of beginning a book with the narrative past tense. But uh, it is very odd that they began a book of the Bible with the narrative past tense. Uh, in this case, uh, it suggests that the author wanted this book to be viewed as a continuation of another book or a continuation of another story. Now our hint comes fairly early on in the book. All, right away, the author says, in the days when the judges ruled. So we know the author is trying to place this book uh, in the context of the judges. Now, you could read that phrase and think, oh, maybe it doesn't really refer to the book of Judges. Uh, now in, our, in the Christian Bibles, the book of Ruth is placed directly after the book of Judges. Um, in the Jewish text, that's not the case. It wasn't the case in antiquity. So where, when, and how that happened, I'm not sure. But, uh, but it is a convenient thing that the Christian Bible has Ruth after the Judges because actually, when you go through the book of Ruth, you find a lot of phrases and wording that's unique to the book of Judges. And yet it also appears in Ruth, which suggests that the author had some kind of close connection to the narrative in the book of Judges. Uh, some people even suggest it may have been the same author. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's that. That's something you won't get in translation. And even if you're a native Hebrew speaker, you most likely would just read over it and not think about it. But when you really sit and dwell on this verse and and grow in an understanding of grammar as well a little bit, you begin to realize, wait a second, what's the narrative past tense doing beginning a book? And uh, and you can see already with the very first word of the book, if you if you consider this, uh, you can see already that the author what a little bit you get a little peek into the author's intentions for this book or um, how they wanted what they wrote to be viewed uh, and I would say that this word testifies to the author's desire for this book to be seen as a continuation of some previous narrative uh, which I would say is the book of Judges or something in the book of Judges perhaps um, for instance well I won't spoil it so but there are some some yeah anyway so that's that uh, so now this is the point where those of you who are only interested in you're not interested in learning Hebrew that's where you can check out maybe you already checked out a while ago those who are interested in learning Hebrew I'll just explain very briefly these letters that spell the word so Vav notice it's a full height letter um, basically, if you were to, I would say full height, meaning look at the word came. Uh, so the vowel would come from the bottom to the top, like this one right here. And notice actually, just like the M has a little curve up there. You don't have to do that, that curve uh, at the top of the letter. If you're writing it for yourself, you can just do a straight line. But it's full height. Uh, if you want, I would say when you're starting, use like college ruled paper and just do the full height of a line, like from one line to the next or almost to the next line, I don't know, whatever. But, and then you'd notice it's half as tall and it's at the top part there. It also has a curve, but likewise, you can just do just a straight vertical line, uh, half of the height. In antiquity, uh, oftentimes in ancient texts, the Vav and you'd get a little confused. The scribes oftentimes wrote them very similar and at least to the modern eye, it's very hard to distinguish them apart sometimes. So context would tell you if you're reading an ancient text, uh, what's what. And sometimes you just have to guess, best guess. But uh, the letter, so anyway, this is Vav. It sounds like V in this word. Yud sounds like Y in this part of the word. He sounds like H. He, ha. And um, Yud is same letter as here, but at the end of the word it sounds like E. So here's an opportunity to learn the difference between a vowel and a consonant. A uh, consonant sounds like uh, limits airflow in speech, I would say. Uh, 
and so y limits airflow when we speak. Just imagine trying to sing at the top of your lungs while making the y sound. You really can't pelt it out as easily as you could if you made the e sound. So e is so easy. You can blast your air out, have as loud a volume as you want, uh, really just, uh, yeah. So vowels, yeah. So in Hebrew, there are no dedicated, no letters dedicated to being only, to only representing vowels. So letters can represent either consonants or vowels. Uh, in English, we have dedicated vowel letters. So A, E, I, O, and U are dedicated vowel letters. Uh, yeah, um, although like for instance the word beautiful, uh, it sure sounds like there's a Y in front of the 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 U, when really it's just E A. So, um, yeah, how does that work? Uh, but in general, A E I O and U are vowel letters in English, and. Um, yeah, but the Y in English sometimes represents a vowel and sometimes represents a uh, a consonant. For instance, in the word by, like by, the Y represents the I sound, and that's a vowel sound. So in this word, uh, yeah, this yud is a con represents a consonant sound, y, and, and this yud represents a vowel sound, e. So all together we have v, y, and e. Um, so you might be asking, wait, if there's v, y, v, v, where's the? How does it become vai, vai? Um, basically, ancient texts in many languages, uh, well, Arabic, Hebrew, a lot of um. Other ancient languages were like um, like hieroglyphs or Chinese don't even have like phonetic writing uh, in their most ancient form, but um, they had to save space however they could, and so uh, a lot of languages, uh, if phonetic languages, either didn't didn't write vowels at all or wrote the bare minimum. So here the e sound at the end, they felt it was important to put a to use this yud to represent the e sound, um, but they didn't feel it was necessary to put a, the a sound or va yihi to fill in that sound there, and there is no letter really that would represent that anyway, but um, in Hebrew. So, but in context, it's easy to know it's this form. I'll tell you, there's only one other form of the same exact word that this could be. Um, uh, the other form that this could could be, if you didn't know, if you, without context, it could be, and it will be. But um, that doesn't make sense, does it? Because it says, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, then it would be a prophecy. And it will be in the days of the judging of the judges, and there will be a starvation in the land and uh i don't know anyway it, it could be that but it, it would be very weird i mean i guess you could that'd be very interesting actually to think of it that way but i for now keep it simple so uh in general everybody's always read it as vaihi and there are also very ancient texts that testify to that pronunciation there is a system of vowel symbols that was invented about a thousand years ago uh, that does testify to that and also we have like greek translations from uh ancient times like a few hundred years before jesus that testify also to that understanding so um yeah i'm pretty sure people have been reading it this way for thousands of years now uh so yeah anyway all right, so that's that. And as far as practicing writing this, I think I already said this, but this is a full height letter. This is half height, top of the line. I don't know if I said how to write this. Just notice it's full height, but also full width. I would say it's as wide, probably as wide as this C, if you were gonna compare. Um, 
So write it however you like, whatever works. Notice there's a gap there, vertical line, and this is like a backwards, almost like a backwards R or something in English. So, and again, the letter U. So that's that. That's all I have to say about the word Vayihi. As you can see, there's some issues that translators face, some confusion about why they would even put things, even in the modern day, like that it's not a literal translation. Um, in general, I have always loved the NASB, actually, but uh, I'm a little confused by this opening to the book and their translation. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Uh, in the next video, we'll move on to the next word or words, whatever seems most fitting in the time we have. I'm trying to keep these videos uh, close to 15 minutes or less for the sake of uh, listeners and especially the, the stuff that doesn't interest or for those who aren't trying to learn Hebrew keep that stuff um, in 10 minutes or less